I was feeling in a total rut recently and I was watching a podcast and I honestly can't remember what the podcast was, but one of the things they said that how they started off their day was they would actually start with a visualization of what they wanted their day to look like. And I, I, I took that in stride and thought like, how, how would I go about that? So when I get up in the morning, I will actually ground my feet and think about what does my day look like? And I think about what are the things that I'm going to eat today? What are the exercises I want to do? And how do I want to take care of my body? What do I want my work to look like? And how do I know I'm going to be successful? And how do I actually want to interact with my family? What will that time with my family look like? And that really helped me to find success in the days and, and really kind of set my mind up for um, a good day ahead. Now, it didn't mean that every day how I visualized my day, it turned out exactly the way that I had set out for it in the morning, but it did help to set that up. And so after those visualizations, what I started doing is focusing on what are things I'm grateful for. And I think really kind of starting your mind in that way helps to set you up to win the day. And that's why I really enjoyed this conversation with Bobby Policino. Bobby is a head of school, upper um, uh, head of upper school in uh, the Maryland area. And he talks about his new book, The Principal Leader. And he talked about how these principles, how these things really promote a notion of not work-life balance, but as he terms it, work-life harmony. And so I really enjoyed this conversation, gave me a lot to think about and how I take better care of myself to, to help take better care of others. And I think that's really what we do in education. But sometimes we will actually hurt ourselves in the support of others, but then actually eventually that catches up to us. And so there's a lot to think about in this podcast with Bobby that really resonated with me. I know it will with you as well. So thank you again for joining another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have Bobby Policino, who is the head of upper school uh, at a school, is that correct? Did I say, is yep. it upper school in Maryland? Yes. Uh, he's having a little bit of a rough day. He's a Yankees fan and then we're recording this. The Yankees just got swept out of the playoffs by Houston Astros. Going to do a little, gonna do a little <laughs> sad trombone <laughs> sound. Sorry, I had, to, I had to rub it in. I, I, I'm not like, I don't really... I'm like interested in baseball, but there's no team that I like love. It, it was actually, well, I, yeah. I say I don't say I'm a baseball fan. I say I'm a Yankees fan. If I'm I'm not going to be watching the Astros and Phillies. Right. I I'm going to watch the Phillies. I'm 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 all in on Bryce Harper. I'm like interested. I just like I like personalities, so that's probably why I like go. baseball so much. Uh, so Bobby, um, Bobby's been uh, in education for you know 20 plus years. He's done it all as an administrator, as a teacher. Uh, he has a new book coming out called The Principal Leader, and we'll be talking about that uh, in this podcast, amongst other things. So, Bobby, if you can just introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do today, and how you got there. It's a great place to start. Sure. So thanks again for having me on, George. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Bobby Policino. I'm head of the upper school at Bullish, which is a K-12 independent school uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., um, I am originally from upstate New York um, and was a high school uh, student athlete, uh, played across in college, uh, didn't have any plans to get an education, uh, was going to be in a, a college across coach and uh, got a phone call in August uh, from a buddy's brother, boarding school needed a biology teacher and I went in and that was in uh, August of 99 and here I am uh, still in education. Uh, I absolutely love the opportunity I get to work with kids every single day. Um, I enjoyed it as a teacher, uh, as a coach, coaching soccer and lacrosse. Um, and now, as I said, I'm, I'm head of an upper school of about 575 kids uh, with 70 faculty and uh, enjoy working with them every day. I also have the, um, the good fortune and opportunity to have my three children who are in ninth grade, fifth grade, and second grade come with me to school every day. They go to school mm -hmm. here, so I get to see them throughout the day. Uh, my younger two, I think appreciate that more than my teenager, uh, but someday she'll look back fondly on it. I'm right. sure. Well, um, hey, and then you can like, we, we were actually, I don't want to say interrupted, but one of your kids came in like while we were right. having conversation. I was like, Oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, you didn't even mention that. And I was like, Oh, that's, 
they must go to school there. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. How, how is that like, how is that something that you deal with, um, with your kids going to school? Like, how do you deal with that too? Like, maybe we should have your kids on the podcast and like, we'll get a little, you get, you know, or, or have my, or have my wife on and see how she responds. Right, right. Um, you know, it, when they were younger and, and I have the two that are still younger, um, I was more involved, you know, I've been pretty clear, um, around sort of boundaries with my oldest who just started ninth grade this fall that, um, you know, I'm not going to talk to teachers, coaches, I'm gonna, my wife will handle that just to make sure, um, people aren't made to feel uncomfortable at all. Um, and with my youngest too, obviously if something goes wrong in the playground, I can get a phone call from the nurse that we got a skin knee or a bonk head or whatever it might be. Right. Um, but, you know, it, I feel very fortunate. The other last Friday, there was a fifth grade shark tank. So all the fifth graders put together their entrepreneurship ideas. And, you know, I'm here. So I get to right. carve out an hour to go see that. Or, you know, my daughter has a, a JV field hockey game. I can walk out of my office and go right to the field. And so um, that is not lost on me that I yeah. get an opportunity to see my children at school that other people might not get to. Do you think, do you think that actually... And I'm sure I'm trying, I'm trying to think of my own experience too. Do you think that the teachers are very cognizant of that, of your kids? Like, do, do you think that's a thing? I don't know if I should even ask this because it, it's this a is good a question. Of- you know, <laughs> it's a good question. We have a fair number of faculty and administrators that have kids here. So it's not yeah. uncommon. Right. Um, I would imagine there are some days where someone thinks that, you know, I, right. I think it's, I wonder more about my kids and their, um, classmates you know and how that might be some days um although my youngest who's in second grade is the uh has the most sort of spunk in her so sometimes the second grade class will be walking down the sidewalk and i'm walking and every single second grader will say hi to me except my daughter (laughs) (laughs) that's amazing yeah i got i got one of those too so yeah that's awesome yeah that is she'll say she'll say hey mr policy you know how are you today that's awesome Good for her, right? Yeah, that's good. I like a, a little, a little bit spunk. It's good, right? Hey, yeah. so it's actually we 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 actually started education at the same time. We both went there uh, in 1999. Uh, yeah. And funny enough, my goal is never to become a teacher. I was more interested in coaching basketball. And yeah. I I distinctly remember in one interview that I had, and it was uh for it was a a small town. They had trouble getting teachers. And I remember the uh, principal, it's probably my second or third year, second year, actually. The principal said, you know, we're going to offer you the job, but I do have this concern that you're more interested in coaching sports than you are teaching. And I'm like, well, that's probably a fair, <laughs> it's probably a fair <laughs> concern. Like I, like I, I didn't want to lie. Like I was right. probably at that time, I was more interested in that. But you can you see there's a there's a ton of crossover you know good yeah. coaching good teaching um, you know things that that are matter so like how do you feel your you know your experiences you know being heavily involved in sports coaching uh, has benefited you as an educator as a teacher like do you, is there crossover are they two completely different things for you or like how how do you see that Yeah no I think there's a lot of crossover and I think that you know one of the things in in athletics, obviously, is that, you know, you are getting um, feedback on a regular basis, you know, that depending on the classroom you're in doesn't always happen, you know, but every day in practice, you're getting feedback from your coaches, from your teammates. Um, Then obviously, you know, games are similar to assessments and things like that. They don't always go your way. Um, But what one of the things that you learn in athletics is, you know, there are things that are outside of your control in that assessment, Mm -hmm. right? For, for the most part, when you sit down for that biology test, if you studied, if you did all your work, you're paying attention in class, you prepared, in all likelihood, you're going to do well on that. You know, you could have done everything you needed to for the right. game, but maybe it's raining. Maybe it's, maybe a call didn't go your, whatever. So many different things can happen. Someone got hurt They're so that are outside of your control. And so what you learn on the court, on the field, on the track, on the ice, is that you have to respond to adversity that you didn't expect which I don't think always happens in a classroom and it shouldn't, right? We shouldn't be constantly throwing things unexpected at the kids in a classroom. Uh, So I think there's definitely that idea of getting the feedback and that consistent feedback loop. Um, And I think also in coaching, it can be easier to build relationships and you can recognize how you're building those in practice games, the locker room, et cetera, and say, okay, 
am I doing the same in the classroom? Why or why not? You know, what, what's different and, yeah. and what can I do to mitigate, you know, some of those challenges? You know, and so I, I remember I went to a uh, coaching clinic and they, they were talking about basically assessment, even though they didn't call it assessment, but mm-hmm. they were talking about one of the, so you have a kid who's playing basketball, shooting a free throw, they miss. And a lot of coaches say like, we need you to hit that shot. Right. And it was like, do you think the kid wanted to miss the shot? Like, what did that right. actually do? So in anything, um, you're actually probably putting more pressure on the kid, but not helping them in any way. Right. So I remember when I played basketball and I'm so appreciative, I had such a good high school basketball coach, you know, when I missed that shot, um, I remember him saying like, Hey, you're, you're George, you're, you're tired. You need to bend your knees a little bit more. Cause it's, you know, you're, you, you need, you know, you're, you're not, you're not shooting on fresh legs right now. So I remember like kind of going through this and it would always help me with my second free throw if I missed the first. Right. And I was, we, I, I t- mentioned, I, I know we both know Megan Lawson. She's a very good friend of mine. And I talked about that analogy with her and she had said, you know, that's kind of like an administrator saying to a teacher, we need to get those test scores up. And it's like, do you think the teacher wanted the test scores to be bad? Like, is that, <laughs> right. is that what you wanted? Right? Like that's not, that's actually not helping anything. Right. It is, it is actually like, what, what, how can you support me in getting that process? Because I don't want to do bad, but you just telling me I'm not doing good enough is not actually improving things. In fact, it's right. making, you know, me not, I don't know, I want to say uncomfortable, but not helping me through that adver- adversity. Um, mm. as you say. So like when, when you look at that stuff, like the, the assessment and that connection to it, um, did you, did you like a lot of those things are translating not only in, um, you know, like how we build relationships, but even do you see it in how, like it, like what good teaching is, right? Like yeah. assessment, how do you go through that process? Right. And I, I think it's, you know, coming from that place of curiosity, you know, we're, we're too quick to judge sometimes. Um, cause as you said, nobody wants to miss the shot or has, right. have low test scores. Um, and even when we, we think we're, trying to ask a question to help when we say, looks like you're having a tough day, right? right. Or you had a bad practice. What happened? Like you're, you're just right. setting them up, right. To yeah. just be on the defensive as opposed to, Hey, how are you feeling today? Or how did you, you know, looking at the test scores, did you get a chance to take a look at the test scores? What were, you know, what were your thoughts as you went in there? How did you feel you yeah. know, they were going to do? And, and same thing in a class, you know, sometimes you, you pop into for an observation and, you know, the, the lesson's not going well, which, you know, in good teaching, there's going to be days that things don't go well, because that means your teachers are taking risks. They're not just staying to the tried and true. They're challenging the kids. And how do they respond to that and engaging in those conversations? Because as you said, it's about the relationship and the connection that you have. And so I think always coming in from that place of curiosity, um, which can be hard sometimes, you know, you have to remind yourself, like, I need to, how I ask this question is sometimes more important than the actual question itself. Yeah. And there, there's just, and I think like knowing the people that you're asking the question the way, like I, I, I will say this, uh, my high school coach would yell at me all the time and he would mm-hmm. like, he'd yell at me and it, it just made me better. And he would not, he would not yell at some other players. And sometimes I would actually get frustrated and yeah. say like, Hey, like, and it was just like, Hey, like I'm okay with you yelling at me. Why are you not yelling at this person? <laughs> Right. Right. Like, and they're like, well, cause they don't, they don't actually react the, in the way that's positive the way you do. Yeah. Right. And sometimes it was just, he knew that was the thing that, but he didn't, but trust me, he did not do that day one. He had to get yeah. to know me next. And I'm not like, I don't want anyone going like, I need to start yelling at some kids. Right. Like that's not the takeaway right. here, but it was like, really, he knew uh, us as individuals. And that was something that really mattered to me was he knew what would, what would help me to grow and was a different approach for different players. And he really kind of, yeah. that. And it's something that really matters to me. And it's, you know, so applicable to what we do in the classroom. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, cause I would say, George, if I were to go back and talk to my first year coaching self, it was the same thing because I, I responded, I didn't mind the yelling. It didn't bother me as a player. Right. Um, you know, we talked about how the problem with some teachers of today is they were taught by the teachers of yesterday. Right. And they're just carrying yeah. that forward. And so I would say my my first couple of years of coaching, I was definitely um, an undisciplined doing, yeller. Doing Everybody was. Right? 
Yeah, You're everybody was yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And becoming more nuanced with that uh, yelling as as I developed as a coach, certainly because you're right. It's it's all about knowing how people are going to respond to that, and it's you know yeah. situational leadership now and working with teachers. Yeah, I, the my my first year of coaching, I think I was like four or five games in. And I always like yelled at refs. I was like, get another case and you suck. But I like, I was smart enough to like, I'm going to yell at the ref just enough where they don't give me a technical. Like I, I can figure out the line, but yep. I'm going to push it. Right. Because then, then they're going to like, uh, you know, take the call my way. And then I remember actually some of my players like yelling at the refs, not knowing the line, getting technical fouls. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, seriously, like, why right. would you do that? Right. And a ref pulled me over. And he said, he goes, George, you love these kids. I can tell you're really passionate about this. And they look up to you. I can see that in the work they do. So if you yell at me nonstop, they're going to do that as well. So you got to really think, how are you actually modeling to these kids and how they interact? Because yeah. it's going to stick with them. Whatever you do, good or bad, they're going to do it as well. Yeah. And I remember, it was actually, I remember that conversation. I could, I remember, I can remember everything, like where I was, you know, where I was on the bench. Um, you know, when he pulled me over, he didn't give me a tack. He didn't do this. And I actually never yelled at a ref ever again. And it was like, I was like, yeah. Oh, and I sort of like, oh, now I know why you're yelling at the refs. It's me. I'm the issue. Right. So it's right. kind of funny to think about that. Hey, so we're going to talk about um, your new book coming out. But before we actually get into that conversation, um, I actually don't want to talk about the content. I want to talk about the process. I know you said sure. you, we were talking about this. You've been working on this. It's two, 2022 when we're recording this. You said you've been kind of like looking at this since like 2017. Is that correct? So we're yeah. like several years. Yeah. So like tell the people about the writing process and like, cause I know it's very close to being, you know, out published. What was that process like? What were some of the things that, you know, enjoyed? What are some of the things you struggle with? How, yeah. how did it go for you? Sure. Um, so I had gotten for, uh, I guess, cr as a Christmas gift in 2017, right around there, um, I'd gotten the book uh, Extreme Ownership um, and read that book and was doing some other reading around leadership. I This was in year three now in this role. Um, and I had a few challenges with it, you know, coming in as a dean of students and as a lacrosse coach, you know, um, kids make mistakes. I get that. And then, you know, now I have adults reporting to me and I'm really struggling with adults making mistakes. Like it's right. just something I needed to, to think about. And so what I started doing was, you know, taking these books I was reading, articles I was reading from HBR or McKinsey um, podcast and just taking down, like writing down, all right, what, what are the strategies that other people are using that seem to be successful? Like what are some lessons I'm taking away? Let me really take this content in. And I started creating this document on a, it was a Google doc really yep. of these, you know, linking articles and all these just different ideas. And um, I probably got up to about 20 pages. Um, I was thinking, all right, so what, what am I doing with this? Um, you know, I shared it with a couple people and someone said it'd be a good white paper. Um, and then, you know, COVID hit in, in spring of 2020 and all of a sudden I had a lot more time in the morning, you know, our, right. our school was virtual. Um, I did not have to get three kids up in time to get dressed and out the door. And um, at that point in 2020, I was I was pretty set with my morning routine. Uh, get up at 4:30 to exercise, um, write um, in a gratitude journal, do some meditation, um, and I didn't change it. So even though I didn't have to get out the door at six o'clock, 6:30 anymore, I still kept getting up at 4:30. And now I had this time, and so I had time to read, I had time to write, and really start to flush out the ideas for this book. And as people were struggling for various reasons in that early part of the pandemic during the shutdown and everything, um, my resiliency, my ability to, to keep moving forward didn't waver at all. It didn't change. And part of what I realized was it had to do with my routine. It had to do with my habits that I had built for myself and realize that this probably is a book that could help other people. Um, whether they're current leaders or aspiring leaders, because it's just showing a path and a journey that I was on that can help set a framework for them. Uh, and then, so then I'm done and then start reaching out to publishers and, mm -hmm. you know, seeing what can happen through that process. Um, I got many a rejection and I, you know, mentioned to my wife that supposedly uh, there were a lot of those for uh, JK Rowling, you know, and at some point someone right. was going to, 
somebody would agree to the book. Um, and so here we are now, uh, Darren Pepper and his team Road to Awesome uh, is going to be the publisher. And I, I couldn't be happier. And I really appreciate them, you know, taking a risk on me and agreeing to put the book out at the end of the year. So, I, you know, like I'm listening to you and there's advice I get like and one of the reasons I asked about this, because I'm like really curious on the process of, you know, kind of people, how they create stuff, how they go through that content. And um, a lot of people listening to the my podcast are people that are interested in writing books or, you know, starting their own podcast, things like mm -hmm. that. Too. And one of the things I really love about what you said was basically you just started creating stuff and you like were doing things that you're interested in. And then eventually, as you continue doing that, then it flickered to actually become a book. Right. The problem I see a lot of times is people just say, I want to write a book. And then they just like, so they're just like, and, and I think that's some of the weakest stuff is that they're just looking to, to have pages, you know, in a cover, but they're not really passionate about what they're doing. And like innovators mindset. And it's kind of like interesting because that was one of the reasons I asked the question. Cause like, basically I had been writing about from like 2009, just started writing. And I started to realize how passionate I was about innovation and how important that was to me. And then, and then people reached out to me and said, Hey, like, would you ever write a book on this stuff? I'm like, Oh, like, I, that's not something I really thought of. It's just something I'm passionate about. So I think, you know, if, if you're ever people that are listening to this, if you're ever interested in writing a book, don't start by focusing on writing a book, find what you love right. and just if then, then it will, then it will come off the pages. Then it will be like something that people are inspired by. But I think to write a book just so you can say you wrote a book, isn't going to really give you a high quality book. And that's, that right. is my opinion for this. So it has to be something that you, I, I feel for me, I've, you know, been a part of four books. There are things that have to like hit me not something I like push out and that that to me is really right. powerful. So I, lo yeah. I love that you share that process. So tell us a little bit about the principal leader. What is the book about? Um, and what do you, what do you actually hope it achieves? Sure. Um, so really it's about identifying, you know, principles that will allow you to be a, a more successful leader, you know, both today and, and down the road. Um, you know, you're looking at this idea of relationship principles, um, leadership principles, leadership strategies. Um, I talked about fitness principles, and I, I refer to those as your your mental, your physical, and your spiritual fitness. Mm -hmm. um, and then mental models and sort of how you go through a process and decision making. And and really, um, as I said, it's for current and aspiring leaders. And and I as I read it, I go back through it, I look at it, and I'm like, and there might be a page or two in here where somebody comes into my office and says, hey according to your book, you, you think you should do this and you didn't do that yesterday. And, and I think that's going to be good right. for me. I think, you know, I think accountability is so important. Um, yeah. you know, when you put yourself out there for people to say, Hey, you know, is, do you really believe this? Is this something that you strive for and how do you go about this? Um, you know, my hope is that it's going to help current leaders who are not getting the coaching and the support that they need. I think, you know, mm -hmm especially as we look at a shortage of educators in this country right now, whether you're working at a charter school, public school, independent school, um, whatever it may be, um, a lot of people, you know, are getting promoted and put into different positions and they're not always ready for that. They don't have the skills, you know, a great teacher becomes a department chair and they don't necessarily know how to interact with adults in that leadership way. Um, so I think there are tips and strategies in the book. I share um, some of my own experiences about sort of how I moved from A to B and, and what to do there. And if, you know, if it helps a handful of leaders, you know, be better tomorrow than they were the day before, then I feel like the book's been a success. Okay. So here, here's a question I've been thinking about quite a bit, uh, lately. So let's say I, I read this book and I embrace all the things that you're talking about. What will the end result of that look like? So tough, it's a tough question, right? Yeah, I, it I, I is. All this in about education is that yeah. like, hey, if we do all the things that you say, what will that actually look like, right? Like, hey, this is the yeah. mission, this is the mission. What will this look like if, if we do all these things to say? What, what does that look like in our classroom, right? Like, uh, we like I was actually just writing about this before um, I got on this podcast with you. It was like, hey, we want to be all our kids to be career and college ready, but then actually people don't follow kids when they 
leave school to see if they achieve those things. <laughs> right. So it's like, well, how do you know that you actually achieve those things? Are you just saying that for public consumption? Or, you know, like, how, how do I know that? Like, what, right. what, does that, what does that look like, you know, in the end result? Yeah. I mean, from, from my perspective, it's going to be healthier relationships throughout your life. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, who you are at school should be the same person you are in the grocery store and the same person you are at home. Mm -hmm. You know, and too often educators put all of their patience and energy and focus into their students and don't have enough when they go home. And that's when, you know, some habits and choices, you know, don't align with the, the values and the principles that they say they espouse at school. Um, and so I think as you go through and you realize that, you know, how you ask a question, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're talking to your first grader uh, in your classroom or your ninth grader in your English classroom or your spouse or your own child at home, you know, how you do that is a habit and a choice. Right. And so for me, somebody who reads this book and says, you know what, I'm going to think about how I engage in each conversation. And, and one of the things I say in that book is that after every interaction, you either built up capital and strengthen the relationship with the person or you broke it down. You don't really maintain it. Right. And so what are you doing to build up those relationships? How are you positively engaging in those? And, you know, where are you at the end of the day? I mean, in terms of, you know, do you still have energy? You know, how much are you, right. how much are you putting in your own tank? I think it's a really, I think it's a fine line. I think it's something people are talking more and more about coming out of the pandemic is looking for that, um, I refer to it in the book as a work-life uh, harmony, not a balance, because I don't know that it should right. be a perfect 50-50. Um, and there are times where, like, if you're on some, if you're at the beach for a week for vacation in the summer and you're a 12-month administrator, you shouldn't be thinking about work. You should be right. all in on your family time. Yeah. Uh, and there's other times where you have to say to your spouse, I'm not going to be home tonight. I have a board meeting coming up. I have to meet with the superintendent, whatever it is. You know, you're going to be leaning a little heavier towards work, but at the end of the week, end of the month, end of the year, how was your rhythm? You know, were you right. able to, to seamlessly go back and forth? And so that's, you know, that's what I'm hoping. We'll see. You put me on the spot with that question, George. That's, well, hey, that's, we do the hard hitting questions here, right? That's what, <laughs> that's what happens on Innovators Mindset Podcast. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, I actually, I, I asked this question quite a bit and it's, I, 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 I like the work life harmony. Uh, cause I, I'm like, that's, that's where I've always struggled with the word balance is like, people think like, it's like you have, like, it's all equal how you spend your time. Like I have an hour of this hour and that's not, that's not how it works. Right. right. And like at different times, I, I feel like it's okay that I was way more invested in my work than maybe what I am now because my life situation is different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that's okay. And so I think sometimes we like, Oh, you need, you know, more time with family when someone might be going through a really tough relationship. And the last thing they like, I get it. Right. Like people go through different things. And I think sometimes the notion of balance is what I am doing for me should work for you. And that, so right. harmony is something you figure out for yourself. Now, so I've asked this question quite a bit uh, of groups I work with, and I always find it really interesting. So I'll say to people, how many of you check your personal text messages uh, during the school day? And you can see people are like, like slowly putting up their hand. They're like embarrassed by it because, you know, they should be at work and stuff like that. Right. And I, you can tell right away, tons of people are lying because they're like, wor they're worried their boss is looking. It's going to make them look bad, whatever. So then I flip the question and say, how many of you check your work messages when you're at home? And it's just like, just hands raised. And it's like, yeah. no one even thinks about it. I say, okay, so how come it's totally okay for your, for your work life to infringe on your personal life, but your personal life not to infringe on your work. Right. And, and like, and see, and understand, like you have to figure that out. So if someone says to me, like, I, you know, I don't check my personal messages at the, you know, during work. But when I go home, I don't check my work email. I'm good with that. You have to figure out that solution for yourself. Right. right? Cause I actually, I know for me, sometimes I, I like will work at certain times that are weird at night. Cause I, I just don't want to, I feel like stressed if I have a bunch of stuff to catch up to. Like I kind of have like in my mind, here's what my email inbox should never be at. Like it should yeah. never be at like 20. Right. So like that's way too high for me. And and so like that is something that you have to figure out for yourself. Um, obviously, you and I were talking before 
uh, the, the, like my own health journey over the last couple of years is something I'm really, you know, yeah. passionate about. I think uh, it's weird. Like, I think it's, I love that you have it. Cause I think it's made me better at my job. It's made me better at what I do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, even though I'm maybe not, I don't want to say this, but I'm not as invested in my work as I used to be. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, because I think that I was so invested in my work to a detriment of my personal health. Yeah. And, and so when I started focusing on my health, maybe I spent less time working, but I spent better time when I was actually working, if that made sense, where I wasn't. Yeah. So how do you, how, like, how do you, like, t tell us a little bit, I'm, I'm interested in that. Like, what's, tell me a little bit about that health principle and, and why you see it as so valuable. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to feel invested in your own health and wellness and, and where you are, you know, people can't do that for you. And, and the only way you're going to do that is if you are setting aside time and, yeah. and creating it and also recognize what does that mean? So um, it's fun. You know, when I was writing the book, I talked about getting up at four 30 to work out and blah, blah, blah. And someone's like, do you have to say that? Like, you're, are you making people feel guilty if they don't get up at four 30? And I said, you know what? You're right. I can take that out. I said, cause it's not about that. I get up at four 30 cause I have three kids, two dogs, a wife, and the house right. is quiet and I can be uninterrupted. Uh, yeah. And then also for me, when I get home at the end of the day, I don't want to have something else on my to-do list. So yeah. that's why I work out in the morning to be done with it. I get up um, at 429. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just, the other, be, I just had to be one minute better. Right. The, <laughs> the other piece, uh, but the other, the piece that really goes with that for me more than the physical exercise was the mental exercise around sort of, you know, since 2017, starting this gratitude journal and and yeah. writing and reflecting every morning um, and just getting my head clear every single morning, because yeah. that allowed me to be in a much better space in the morning with my kids and with my wife. And when I got to work, because the, the way I do it is sort of and everyone has their own method. And I think that's important. You know, I brain dump in the morning into that journal of, you know, lessons learned from the day before and, you know, what I'm going to do today. And then I always end it with, what are three things I'm grateful for today and, mm -hmm. and, and write that out. Um, and it just puts me in such a different mental place than it was previously, because otherwise I'm going through my head all morning of what do I have to do? How am I going to get through that? I'm already, the cortisol is just coursing through my body, right. you know, at five 45 in the shower, um, getting ready for school, as opposed to having already spent that hour and 15 minutes of my own time where I got some stress out. I got my body moving. I got right. my brain thinking about other things. Um, and when you do that, you're, you're more open to support and be there for other people. You, you can't have empathy when you're living a high stressed lifestyle every moment of every day. It's just, it's not available. You can't be there for people. So the, the, I, I love the gratitude journal. Um, that, that thought, one of the, I was, I was like, really felt like I was slumping. I was having a tough time the last, I don't know, couple months. And I started doing this thing and I can't remember. I watched it on some podcast. I was like, I'm going to try this. So basically what I'll do is like, first thing when I get up in the morning, I like put my feet on the ground and I visualize, um, what do I want my day to look like? So mm -hmm. like, what am I going to eat? I know that's a weird, like eating has always been my struggle, um, for, you know, and I, I, I'm not the guy who can just eat whatever I want. Like, you know, if I look at cheeseburgers, I get, you know, gain weight. And so <laughs> I like, I like have to be really thoughtful of that. What is my workout going to look like and how, you know, how am I going to spend time with my family and how am I going to do, how am I going to look, you know, at my work? And then, so I'd focus on those things. So I try to visualize what a good day looks like. And then I would think about some things that I was grateful for. And I'll tell you that that really, really helped. And I, I always think about this because I remember I played uh, high school basketball. We were very, very competitive. We had a very good team. Uh, never could win the championship. We were like finished first, second, or sorry, fi finished second, third, and fourth in different years. Uh, in the three years I played high school basketball. And there was a, a, a team, uh, a, a senior women's team, a high school, a different high school. And uh, we knew a lot of the players. And the coach was not a basketball coach, um, but his his daughters played. So he just learned to coach. He learned to coach basketball. He was a hockey guy, yeah. and he would make them always do visualizations. And we were like, "This is okay." Now, put in perspective, this is like early night. This is in the early nineties. Yeah. So we're like, "Okay, okay, crazy." 
they crazy people. Yeah. And we just thought it was the weirdest thing. But then they all, they won championships like every year in basketball and soccer. And, I, and then I was like, oh, maybe there's something to that. Maybe, maybe there's something there. Like, cause they're, they're doing something we can't like we're yeah. struggling with that. And, and so like, I, you know, like they're obviously finding some success because of how they visualize it too. And so like, it's not like, I don't, I don't see it as like about ultimately winning championships. Cause like, that's not what people are doing. They're probably listening to this podcast not right. competing in that, but it is, you know, winning the day. And I think yeah. that, that to me is, uh, you know, that, that is, that has helped me quite a bit. And it doesn't mean the day always goes the way I visualize it, but it's more right. likely to go the way I visualize it when I visualize it in the morning. Cause I'm kind of yeah. setting up, up through that process. And I, I would say, you know, if you had asked me in high school and right. college and right after about the impacts of gratitude, I would have said, you know, that's what mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah, we're not having this conversation. I'm right. not even right. engaging in it. Right. Right. Um, and and one of the, the a turning point that's very vivid in my mind, you brought up the Yankees and their struggles. Um, I'll bring up the other team I mentioned, the Buffalo Bills, who are in a good place right now. Um, but it was, it was Sean McDermott's first year. And I got a text from somebody that said, uh, hey, congrats on the Bills going to the, the playoffs. The Bengals had won a game, so the Bills backdoored their way into the playoffs. Right. And I started the text and said back that said, just one more week till, till they lose and are playing golf with everybody else. Right. And before I hit send, I deleted it. And I wrote, can't wait till they win this week, then go into New England and take down Brady and Belichick and sent that. And I... And it was interesting to me because I realized like I just there was a change in my mind. This idea of right. always expecting the worst or having this negative outcome really changed because of that. Now, the Bills did lose the wild card right. weekend <laughs> that first year. They went to playoffs under McDermott. Um, but it, it just it just hit me like a ton of bricks right. that I didn't send that negative message that like I can't even enjoy the fact they're going to the playoffs because I've already decided they're losing next week. Like right. that's just to right. your point about your visualization, like you, you can't make every day go exactly the way you want, but you yeah. can go in with the right mindset that it's going to. And if something doesn't go perfect, it's not going to shut you down. Oh yeah. There is actually like a, Oh my God. Now I got to find it. I was reading a, a book that talks about this. Like you're, 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 you're setting yourself up. You're prepared for failure, but you're setting yourself up for success. Right. And I think that to me was kind of what resonated with that was, like it's not like you like it's just more likely to happen but it also like as you said it kind of alters your mood right which right. is like putting you in a better space to 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 be successful so yeah, bobby hey i just want to say congratulations on the book i know it's a a tough thing um to do but obviously you visualized it you made it happen <laughs> right and so it's probably going to be out right around the time it's going to be close to playoff time so we'll see how the bills do but we <laughs> believe the bills no, and, i like what you did there we believe they're gonna do well anyway so um so hey make sure everyone listen thanks for taking the time out of your day to to be a part of this hopefully you got something out of it i know i did uh check out bobby's uh connection or contact information below uh keep yep. an eye out for his book um and, and i'm excited for it i'm excited for you and uh congrats to you and uh and to darren and the road to awesome team i know it's gonna be a, a huge success thank you so much george i appreciate it all right. Everyone have a great day. Bobby, thanks for being here. Thank you.